So now we're into the second half of chapter 34. So we're just going to be continuing with vertebrates and going from, you know, less advanced ones to more advanced. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get into the reptiles. So before we were talking about amphibians and how amphibians are still very closely linked to the water. They have that cutaneous respiration, meaning their skin likes to stay a little moist. They lay their eggs in the water. So now we're going to get into reptiles, which going, are going to be a lot more successful on land because they're not so closely linked to the water. So one of the key things that made reptiles so successful was going to be their amniotic egg. And so I have a picture here of their egg, and it's very similar, if you think about it, to a bird's egg. So it's going to have a couple of characteristics about it. It's going to have that yolk sac that's going to provide the young with the food that it's eating. Um, it's going to have the allantois, which is going to be where their waste is going to go into so they don't poison themselves while they're developing. They're going to have an amniotic sac, which is going to be surrounding the developing embryo and protecting them because, you know, eggs are going to get moved around and you don't want those things to get bounced around too much when they're inside the egg so that they're not damaged when they're developing. Um, they're also going to have that porous shell around the outside. Um, but what's really going to be important is this thing called the corian, which is going to lie along the inside of the shell, and that's going to give the shell its watertight membrane, right? So if you think about when you've dyed Easter eggs, right? If you dye Easter eggs, the, um, the level right below it is going to be dyed, and that's because that shell is porous. But that corian is going to be the important part. If you've ever cracked an egg and you've kind of tried to get the shell out, and there's that thin membrane kind of holding the pieces of the shell together, that's kind of how the corian works. And so that's what's going to make the eggs watertight, and that was a huge deal in making them less dependent on the water than amphibians are. Okay, so that's going to be one characteristic. Another characteristic is they're going to have that dry watertight skin. So they're not going to be breathing through their skin. They're going to be able to um, go further away from the water. Um, they're going to have what's called thoracic breathing, which is a type of breathing that we have where we have a diaphragm and we can actually expand our rib cage to take in air. Now that's going to be different from the amphibians. The amphibians don't have that and so they do this weird two-part breathing that we'll talk about in a later chapter. Um, some other important things about um, reptiles, they're going to have internal fertilization. So that's going to allow them to be on land a lot more successfully. If you think about amphibians, they're just throwing gametes out into the water and hoping they meet up. So they're very dependent on the water for that. Um, these guys are going to have a more efficient circulatory system. So now they're going to have that heart with a partial wall that's going to separate oxygen rich and oxygen poor blood. So you're starting to see that separation starting to get to be a little bit better. Um, and these guys are going to be what are called ectothermic poiclotherms. Now let's take those words apart before you freak out. Ecto is talking about outside. Thermic is talking about temperature. So that means they get their body temperature from their surroundings. Poiclotherm is talking about the fact that their body temperature tends to fluctuate. And that makes sense. That should go together with exother or ectothermic, right? Those are going to be organisms that sometimes people call cold-blooded, but they're trying to get away from that because cold-blooded makes you think that they're all freezing all the time, and that's not the case. Um, on the opposite end of that, what we are are called endothermic homeotherms. So endothermic means we generate our heat internally and we do that with muscle contractions. And homeothermic means that our body temperature stays pretty steady all the time, right? Okay, now as far as types of living reptiles that are out there, there's a couple of orders. So remember this is class reptilia. So the first order is going to be chelonia and chelonia are going to be turtles and tortoises. So I've got some pictures of turtles and tortoises here. Um, this is going to be a tortoise. So tortoises tend to live on land, um, and they don't have flippers as opposed to this picture of a turtle where you can see it actually has more flippers, right? And these are going to be spending way more time in the water. This is actually a sea turtle that was nesting in Costa Rica that I was working with. Pretty cool. Okay, so that's going to be the difference. Now, these guys are going to have that two-part shell. They're going to have that top part and the bottom part that come together. So the top part is going to be called the carapace, and the bottom part is called the plastron. And so those are going to be parts of their shells. Now, their rib cage and everything is fused to that. It's not like in the cartoons where if they get tired of their shell, they can just get out of it and kick it across the room. Though They're completely attached to it. Okay. So those are going to be turtles and tortoises. The next group is an interesting one, um, rhinocephalia. So um, 
R-H-Y-N, when we talk about animals, that has to do with the nose, right? If you think about rhinoplasty, right? A nose job. Um, cephalia is talking about the head, right? So um, this is kind of an interesting group that are called tuataras, and this is what they look like. We're going to use a word from a long time ago. Um, yes, there's a tuatara. So um, these guys are like lizard-like creatures, but they actually have a vestigial structure. They have a vestigial eye on the top of their head. And so what it's thought that that's used for is for detecting heat so that they don't overheat in the sun. And so um, they've done studies where they've covered those up or removed them, and the poor little guy is just crack, you know, they totally fry in the sun. So um, that's going to be what is going to put tuataras in their own little group. Now, the next one is going to be order squamata. Order squamata is going to be lizards and snakes. So these guys are going to have paired copulatory organs, and they're also going to have that lower jaw that can detach. And I think I've got a good picture of that for you guys. Let's see. So this is going to be an iguana, which is going to be in that category. And there we go with the snake, right? So you can see how a snake can actually dislocate its jaw. And if you want to see the one that we have um, in lab, we can actually feed it something where you can see its jaw detached. It's pretty cool. Okay, the last group, and I'm sure you can guess what's in this group, crocodilia, right? That's going to include crocodiles and alligators. And these have really not changed much in the fossil record since they evolved, which means they're pretty well set for their environment. Um, so here's a picture of one. And here is a picture of another one, alligator and a crocodile. This one is actually an alligator. The way you can tell is they have a very, very wide, broad snout, and you can only see its upper teeth. Whereas if you look at a crocodile, you can see both its upper and lower teeth, and it has a much narrower snout. Crocodiles tend to get bigger. They also tend to be a little bit more aggressive. So that's the way you can tell them apart. And then in the next picture down, I think I've got another one where you can see alligator much broader, crocodile much narrower. And here you can see the difference in the teeth. Alligator, you can only see the upper teeth. And a crocodile, you can see upper and lower, right? So that's going to be some differences between those two groups. <clears throat> Um, so that's going to be the um, reptiles, then we're going to get into the birds. So class aves is going to be birds, and birds are super cool. They are awesome, awesome creatures. So a couple of characteristics for them. First, they're going to have feathers. Now, feathers aren't always going to be used for flying. If you think about like a penguin, right? They don't actually use them for flying. But those are actually modified scales. Reptiles and birds are like super closely related. If you look at like their claws and like a bird's foot, it looks very similar to a reptile's foot. They both lay eggs. Very, very similar. Um, the other thing that birds are going to have, it's what's called a flight skeleton. Um, whoops, that's not what we want to see. We want to see this. Hopefully I can get this to come up. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> in this picture, this is an albatross that's coming down to land, which is very rare, by the way. But what these guys can do is super cool they can actually lock their wings out. So you know when you like open the hood of your car and you put that little stick under it to hold the hood up? That's kind of how these guys work. This so what they can do is they can actually lock their wings out and they can sleep while they're flying, which is very efficient. Um, the other thing about a flight skeleton, now not all birds can do that, certain ones can. Um, a lot of birds that fly a lot are going to have hollow bones and sometimes their lungs will actually extend into their bones. So you can see here how that bone is hollow. Um, so very, very, very efficient way for them to save energy, right? <clears throat> so if you've ever carried a bird, I mean, they are super light, even like big pelicans and stuff, they're actually very light. Um, so in order to fly, flying is extremely expensive metabolically. So they're going to have a couple of things to help them to do that. First one is that they have to have the most efficient respiratory system possible. So they're going to have tons of lungs and air pockets, and um, they're going to extend into their bones, and that's going to increase their surface area, having as many lungs as possible. And they're going to have this crazy breathing process. <clears throat> so what they want is they don't want to have oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor um, air mixing. So when we breathe in and out, we have oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood, or blood air mixing all the time, not these guys. So when they breathe in, they'll breathe into these lungs, and then they'll contract these lungs and push air into these air sacs back here. These air sacs then, <clears throat> so like let's say it pushed into here and to here. What's going to happen is like let's say these blue ones over here have um, oxygen-poor air in them. They're going to contract, put those into the lungs, 
and the bird will breathe out. So they kind of do this like two-part breathing, so there's never oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor air um, mixing together. Here's another picture kind of showing you that. So there's a later chapter where we'll get into more of how that works, but super efficient. It's really, really neat. Um, now if we talk about their heart, they're going to have that complete separation now. So all these other ones had like a little wall, maybe a bigger wall, but it wasn't complete. These guys have a complete wall separating oxygen-rich and oxygen-poor blood. Um, and then the last thing is that they're going to be what is called endothermic, which means that they're going to generate their internal body temperature themselves, and it's usually going to be running pretty high. And that's because the higher their um, metabolism goes, the faster that they get, the, the higher their metabolism goes, the higher their body temperature is. Okay, so that's it for um, reptiles and birds. Then the last little section we'll do in the next video is going to talk about mammals.